here at CDT. I also lead our internet architecture program. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing Ben Dean, who is our CDT's Ford Foundation Media Democracy Fund Technical <coughs> Exchange Fellow. Um, it's a mouthful, but it basically means he's very, very smart. Um, ben is a technologist and an economist, which enhances two really important areas of CDT's multidisciplinary expertise. And over the past year, we've been thinking about what, if anything, should we or could we do in terms of financial technology or fintech, um, as you may know it. It's clear that there's some pretty serious issues here. Uh, we'll have more to say about our strategy, and if you have input for us, please come talk to us. Um, but an important part of CDT's approach and when we approach anything is demystifying what can seem at times pretty magical types of technologies. And so this is a great example of something that, that, that you can imagine people think is purely magical. Um, but you know, the, 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 being able to get some, not only just a superficial view, but a little bit farther down so you actually reason about the policy issues and the technology issues and how they combine here is a big important part of what we do here at CDT. Um, so we are recording, this is what this crazy Mevo contraption here is. Um, so be aware of that if you're going to talk or anything. The Wi-Fi password is on this thing over here. I'm not going to say it out loud. You can tell by the password why I'm not going to say it out loud. Um, and, and please hold your questions till about halfway through where we're going to stop and, and, and take a breather for a sec. Um, but feel free to write them down until then so you don't forget them. But without further ado, I'm delighted that uh, Ben has developed a really fascinating presentation on all things cryptocurrency, blockchain, and um, Bitcoin. Thanks, Ben. Thank you. Uh, thank you to Joe, and thank you to all of you for joining us here today. Is, can you hear me okay in the back? Yeah? Just let me know throughout the talk uh, if you have any troubles. Uh, so welcome to what I'm now calling Crypto Ledger 101. This is a late change, uh, because as I was preparing or uh, refining this presentation, I thought maybe this word would be more uh, suitable, and I think in the course of the discussion you'll come to understand why. It's not used very commonly, in fact a lot of words are used in this space. You'll hear everybody raving about blockchain and cryptocurrencies, uh, increasingly people are using the word crypto, which drives the cryptographers on Twitter absolutely nuts. Uh, which is not hard, but uh, we'll see at the end of this talk if crypto ledger drives them crazy. And if not, maybe this is a better word to use to describe uh, a very narrow portion of this distributed ledger space, uh, but one that is evolving very quickly. And perhaps for that reason, we have trouble actually having a, a static vocabulary with which to describe what we're talking about. Uh, today's presentation, actually I should mention before I do the presentation, I hold, have holdings in all of these things. Uh, I don't know if the financial transparency helps at all. Uh, you'll come to see that I'm not trying to sell you anything today, but that's probably an important thing to mention as well. Uh, today I'm gonna to run you through a short history of money to start with, because I think that's helpful as a way in which to introduce you to what these crypto ledgers are, and why we have them today, and why they're special. Uh, I'm gonna focus a lot today on Bitcoin. Uh, Bitcoin is by no means not the only a protocol or a company, it's not a company, but there are companies in the space. It's not the only network, it's just one very small part. But I think it's useful as a way in which to introduce you to important concepts, foundational concepts that I think are useful to begin uh, almost as a base, extending one's understanding throughout the space. Um, it's a 101 talk. So just to make sure we're on the same page, how many people here own any cryptocurrencies? Okay, we've got a couple. That's all right. I'm just emphasizing this is a 101 talk. I can't explain everything because it's such a vast space. It's really complicated. It's a total rabbit hole. Um, so suffice to say, this might be common to you already or you might already understand some of this. Um, but for the rest of the crowd, I think you're gonna walk out of here today. I hope you'll walk out uh, with a firm understanding of, of at least what Bitcoin is, what it is, how it works, why it's important, and where this space is going uh, to improve upon what Bitcoin has already done. And it wouldn't be a Washington DC presentation without uh, some policy implications. Uh, we're already grappling with some policy implications from Bitcoin and other cryptocurrency projects, crypto ledger projects like Ethereum. Um, and we're going to run into a lot in the next five to ten years as new projects are developed, uh, as they're let out into the wild, 
and as all those crazy people start using them in ways in which the creators didn't anticipate. So let's talk about the history of money. Um, basically, it's a history of increasing abstraction. Now, these different means of exchange are not mutually exclusive. In fact, uh, a lot of them we still use today. But if you wind back the clock thousands of years, when people wanted to transact, what did they do? They bartered. They would use certain good, like you might trade goats, for a whole lot of wheat, for instance. It's a bit clunky, uh, because you've got to carry all the wheat everywhere. <coughs> You've got a, you know, lots of goats you might be trading. So we eventually started abstracting away from the actual goods themselves. And we started abstracting to things that were relatively rare, scarce. So cowrie shells uh, were, still are a currency used in some of the Pacific Islands. They've been used for thousands of years. They're relatively rare, easy to carry around. You can do improvements on them to increase their perceived value. Uh, and commodities, you know, gold, is the, you know, the, Everyone's flight to safety, you go to get gold, even today. But again, it's still a bit clunky, um, and there are some shortcomings with these uh, commodities, so we came up with representative money. You know, the dollar bills until the 1970s, in the United States at least, you could go and turn, you could exchange it into gold. It's called the gold standard until Nixon got rid of it. Uh, and then since then, we've had fiat currency. Uh, fiat. Its, ba its value is based on a promise, uh, backed by the promise of the US government that's going to have value, uh, whatever that promise is worth. Uh, and then in the last 20 to 30 years, as the world's gone digital, uh, most of the money in supply today is ones and zeros on databases. So the coins in your pockets and the notes in your wallet are no more than 10% of the total money supply. Most of the money uh, is digital. It has been digital for a very long time. And so it's abstracted away even from the physical world in that sense. Uh, and the crypto ledgers, I think, are just the next step after uh, digital money. And the reason that they came about was uh, about eight years ago. Uh, think back eight years ago, what was happening? The world financial system was on the brink of collapse. Uh, fraud, corruption, incompetence, uh, systemically. Uh, brought the world economy, uh, or at least the financial system, on the brink of collapse. And around the same time, somebody posts something on a message board with some code called Bitcoin. Uh, Bitcoin is kind of one of these crypto, uh, it's crypto anarchist, it's a cypherpunk kind of dream, uh, a bit like WikiLeaks is. Uh, you want to have a means of exchange that's digital, that has no central authority. In a way, the philosophical inspiration behind Bitcoin was well, all the bankers have gone and screwed up the financial system. We can't trust the Fed. We can't trust any of these intermediaries. So we're going to set up an online payment system that has no intermediaries. Uh, let's be very clear about what Bitcoin is. This is what it is. A peer-to-peer -peer version of electronic cash allows non-reversible transactions and solves the what's called the double spend problem. I see a lot of people running around saying, we're going to use blockchains to cure poverty and fix land titles and fix medicine, so on and so forth. For a long time, uh, basically what they were doing was saying, well, we've got nails everywhere. Uh, we're going to use a screwdriver to, to hit them in. Bitcoin was not designed to do any of those things, and the original blockchain was not designed to do any of these use cases. Uh, towards the end of the presentation, I'll show how some of the shortcomings in Bitcoin protocol are being improved upon to perhaps one day begin uh, fulfilling these use cases. But we have to be very clear about what it is and what it does and what it does well and what it does poorly. And this white paper here, which you can find all over the internet, is a great place to start. The double spend problem, that's what it solves. So remember I said that kind of the philosophical idea is we're going to remove intermediaries from uh, transactions online. Now, why might you want a centralized mediator? Well, you might want somebody to sit there and verify who is doing which transactions, who owns what, and then have some ledger to reconcile uh, who holds what. But when you eliminate the centralized uh, administrator, uh, it introduces this idea of a double spend problem. If Joe and I want to do an exchange in cash, I give Joe a $100, 100 US dollar bill, for instance. Joe has the $100, I don't have the $100. I can't spend it again, right? The issue with not having any centralized administrator with online uh, currencies, uh, it's just ones and zeros. 
We can copy ones and zeros at virtually zero marginal cost. Um, and as a result, it would be possible, if you didn't have some mechanism in place to stop this, for people to spend the same uh, electronic money over and over and over again. And the system wouldn't work as a result. Bitcoin fixes this uh, in a very novel way. What Bitcoin essentially does is provide a, a trustless double entry accounting system. It's, uh, most people don't realize, but one of the most pivotal innovations in, at least well, in history really, was double entry bookkeeping. It came out of Venice in about the 19, oh, 1350s, and basically the idea was that you could uh, keep track of who owns what and how much it's worth. Uh, this was a relatively novel idea, but it allowed some level of transparency and accountability for the lords and royal families and Catholic church at the time who loved to claim that they had assets that were worth a whole lot of money, and they didn't have debts that were a whole lot of money, and as a result, they got off scot-free. Bitcoin is, in essence, double-entry bookkeeping at scale without a, without a bookkeeper. And when you do this, you've got two problems. You've got one problem, other people who are registering the transactions actually the people who are entitled to register the transactions. <coughs> Second problem, how do you ensure that the ledger is accurate over time if everybody is contributing to it, but there's nobody actually in place to sit there and verify that each transaction not only comes from uh, the, the right people, but uh, the people have the holdings over time. Bitcoin does this in a very interesting way, and that's why it's called a cryptocurrency. On the first problem, are you who you say you are? Uh, it uses public key infrastructure uh, to do this. I'm not going to explain public key cryptography to you today. Uh, CDT already has a full 20 to 30 minute presentation. Uh, these slides will be posted on the website, so you can click on this link and go and have a look uh, in the future. Suffice to say, what does the public key cryptography do? Well, you get a public key and a private key with your account, and you want to make a transaction, you sign it, uh, then somebody's able to look and see that it was indeed you that signed it with the private key, because mathematically you just would not be possible just to fake the key, for probabilistic reasons. So that's one part of the, the equation. Are you who you say you are? This is very similar to the way that uh, with emails, anybody who's used encrypted emails, it's the similar idea. You sign the email with your private key, no one else knows the, the key, or they shouldn't, particularly Adobe uh, should remember that. And uh, as a result, you can prove who you say you are. So let's think about the second part of this. Uh, transactions grouped in blocks and chained together. So remember the second part of the problem is having a ledger that everybody can go to and can be trusted to keep track of everybody that holds what. Uh, the issue if you decentralize it completely is that everybody's gonna start claiming that they all have uh, certain transactions, they have certain holdings, and as a result, the, the system is not very robust. You have to come up with some solution by which to ensure that the integrity of the, de the ledger is, uh, is maintained. We hear a lot about the blockchain. Uh, this is where the concept of a blockchain comes in. Blockchain is a shared ledger. If you go out and download the Bitcoin protocol, you'll download the blockchain. It's huge. Um, and everybody's allowed to access it. Everybody's allowed to write to it. Everyone's allowed to see what's written there. Uh, this idea of a shared ledger is actually, uh, I think, one of the really important parts of, uh, of Bitcoin. Uh, this transparency it creates, similar to the way in which the 1350s double entry bookkeeping created some transparency around who owns what. Because it registers transactions and transactions happen over time, there needs to be a mechanism for us to add transactions over time. This is where the blocks come in. About every 10 minutes, a new block is added to the, uh, the, the Bitcoin blockchain. Those blocks contain some information. They tell you when the transaction took place, who it took place with. Uh, it hashes a whole lot of transaction data, so you have multiple transactions in one block. Um, you have a hash of the previous block in there, which in a way ties it to previous blocks, in a way that uh, creates a lineage that one can go back through. Uh, and then it has a nonce. I'm not going to explain what the nonce is just yet, but it's very important, and I will explain it in just a second. 
remember that the problem we're trying to solve here is that the ledger will be accurate and will maintain its integrity over time. And what's really clever about the, the Bitcoin protocol is it's, uh, it incentivizes people to maintain the integrity of the ledger and it rewards them with the native currency coin uh, token associated with the network. So this is called mining. Uh, the process of mining, it both rewards people for the work they put in and the work that they're doing is maintaining the integrity of the ledger. It's a little bit, it's, it's actually one of the harder parts to explain about this, but let's see how we go. Mining involves, in essence, solving difficult math problems. That's it, in the simplest form. When you solve these math problems using a computer, you're rewarded with Bitcoins. This is what we call proof of work. When you're rewarded over time, uh, the amount decreases. This ensures that the money supply, that can, the maximum money supply, is capped. There's only so many solutions to these math problems. Uh, stability of the money supply is an important part of Bitcoin, part of the reason that it has value, part of the reason that it's perhaps superior over something like fiat currency. The difficulty of these math problems increases over time. The reason that it increases over time is because, remember, we're going to have every 10 minutes a new block appended to the chain. And so you have to increase the difficulty of the problem to maintain that rate at which they're solved. The reward I've just mentioned decreases over time. And this is an interesting kind of trade-off here. What would you want to do with a network at the beginning if you want lots of people to join? Give them a higher reward. So people will flood in, you can build that critical mass. And then over time you start decreasing the amount they're rewarded and forcing them to pay a transaction fee in greater amounts to get their transactions actually registered. Uh, this is very clever, I think. Um, it's an interesting dynamic that was clearly thought through. And what will happen over time is, as the money supply of new Bitcoins created eventually stops, uh, the network is theoretically meant to work on transaction fees that people pay at their transactions added to the blockchain over time. <clears throat> so let's think. What are the difficult? What is the difficult math problem? Just for a second, this isn't necessary for you to know, but it's uh, this will get you started, and I encourage you to go and have a look at this because it's really interesting. Um, cryptographic hash functions. So what what's involved here? You'll take an input, a data input, you run it through a hash function, and you get an output called the digest. The digest is always the same length. Even if you change the length of the input, the digest will come out the same way. If you change any little part of the input, it totally changes the output. In this way, you can find out, you end up finding precisely what the, well, actually, forget that for one second. Input, output. Very easy to go from the input to the output once you've got the solution. Very hard to go from the output back to the input. Uh, for anybody who's familiar with factoring, it's a similar kind of mechanism at play. Um, this math problem is what most of modern digital commerce rests on, uh, the difficulty of these problems. They're exceedingly difficult to do, to solve. In essence, you just have to guess. You have to start from some arbitrary value and guess until you find, hopefully, a result. And it'll take you so long you'll be dead before you can get it, uh, at least with current computing power. Remember I mentioned the nonce before, and the nonce is included in each block. Uh, it's an arbitrary value, um, but keep in mind that if we change the input through cryptographic hash functions, it totally changes the output. Uh, the corollary is that if you slightly change the nonce, it totally changes the output as a result. And you can see here a few different nonces gone through a certain cryptographic hash function and giving, even if you go from zero to one, it's, it's completely different. Um, and depending on how many values you can have, you can have these kind of, not infinite, but you can have huge numbers that are uh, very difficult to guess. This is a little bit like what a block looks like. You've got the version of the Bitcoin protocol at the top, the previous block hash. Remember, that's what attaches the blocks together. Uh, and so if you change that even in the slightest bit, it will show that it's, it's not actually chained to the previous blocks sequentially. Timestamp the bits, and there's the nonce. Once you run all this through a cryptographic hash function, 
you end up with what's called the block hash. Why have I circled these two things red? The nonce is what you're trying to guess. That's the difficult math problem. What is the nonce? And what you're trying to find is a block, an output, that has a certain number of zeros at the beginning. I say a certain number of zeros because you can adjust the number of zeros that are required to be found to increase or decrease the difficulty of the math problem. Uh, this mechanism is what's at play when people are mining. And uh, it's what, I mean, the, the integrity of the system rests upon. Uh, all right. That's a lot of information. That's why I'm doing a breather, uh, for me and for you. Um, let's just do a recap quickly. What have we just learned? Crypto ledgers, decentralized digital transactions that are irreversible. What does Bitcoin do? It solves the double spending problem in a really elaborate way that's, I think, very clever. Uh, three, digital signatures solve one part, uh, the identity part. Not quite the identity. The, the, they verify that the person who's making the transaction is indeed the person who was authorized to make the transaction. Second part, blockchain. It's a public ledger that anyone can read to and anyone can, read, uh, can write to. Mining. Process that ensures that the ledger is maintained across all the people that take part in a decentralized way. Uh, Bitcoin's the reward for taking part in the mining process. And it also creates new Bitcoins. Uh, keep in mind here, just as a, a nuance, you know, we often think about because we hold dollars in our hands, you know, you can have dollars, and sometimes I see stock photos of, you know, round Bitcoin to B, B but they don't really exist. Uh, it's a ledger. It's a reconciliation of all of the holdings that everyone has. But you don't actually like have a Bitcoin. It's, uh, accountants will understand it, um, which is maybe unfortunate because there's not enough accountants around. But this idea that it's a ledger, that you just don't hold Bitcoins, is, uh, is an interesting nuance that's important to take in, into account. And mining, uh, in essence, it's solving difficult math problems. It rests upon probability theory all kinds of interesting stuff in, in the cryptographic field that we don't have time to talk about today, but I've got some readings at the end if you want to have a look and, and learn more, because uh, I found some really great sources that can give you uh, really excellent, rigorous information in about 20, 30 minutes to get them to speak. So, I've talked a lot already, and at this point, at the end of all the technical stuff, uh, if anybody has any questions or any comments, uh, now's the time to go for it because uh, I'm sure some of you do, but, uh, so. Uh, I have a question. What's to stop me from taking the existing public ledger and flooding the net with duplicate copies that up until today are, 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 are correct and then have all the Bitcoins come to me thereafter? Yeah. The, um, the protocol has a, a built-in feature. It defaults to the longest, chain, uh, to the longest blockchain, the one that's got the most proof of work. If you wanted to do what you'd like to do, you would have to solve a certain number of these problems in a row. That is to have the longest proof of work. Um, and in a way, supplant the existing ledger with your fake ledger, right? Remember that these math problems are exceedingly difficult to solve. Um, I've got a slide here. Where is it? It's very good. <laughs> this one. Um, Ken Sheriff puts it this way. Solving one of these math problems is like finding a, a grain of sand on the beach. Um, on all the beaches of the world. It's exceedingly difficult to do once. To do it three, four, five, six times in a row. Uh, so it's conditional probability, even more difficult. There is a, a theoretical attack uh, that your question right, uh, helpfully brings up. Um, if you are able to control over 50% of the total computational power that's guessing these uh, solutions to math problems, you would increase your probability of being able to pull off an attack like this. And we'll see that one of the, one of the interesting emergent phenomena about Bitcoin is precisely this, that it's meant to be decentralized in terms of the end uh, users, but in practice, uh, that's not always so. Um, let's go, you'll go first and then you start. Okay. Um, so this is proof of work. How does it apply? What, where, what's the difference between this and proof of stake? Okay, proof of work, 
I will touch on this later. Okay. So don't but I won't get ahead of myself. proof of work is computational power. So that determines who gets bitcoins. Proof of stake. Uh, how many of the native currency do you have? It will determine uh, your share in voting as to which blockchain is the true blockchain. Related question to the one that was first asked. You, you sort of referred to the enslaving uh, problem where computers are going to be tied by unknown parties to add to their own computational power. So I'd love to have you talk more about that. But my next question is, doesn't quantum computing and its advent basically obviate the fidelity of the system? Yes, great. Theoretically, if you can get a quantum computer running at scale, running Shor's algorithm, uh, you'll be able to do these factoring problems in a way that will break any uh, system that's not been made quantum proof. Um, so this is something that's on my has been on my mind for a while. I've seen people in certain communities talking about it, because for the moment it's really theoretical if we're going to have a quantum computer running at scale uh, to solve these kinds of problems. But if Bitcoin's meant to run until 2040 when the, the Bitcoin supply runs out, but if it wants to keep running until then, you're going to have to make changes to the cryptographic protocol because it's based on factoring and it will require changes uh, to, to, to mitigate that, that threat that you rightly point out. Going back to the 2040 kind of supply and timeline, one of the values you mentioned of Bitcoin is that there is a cap on supply, mm -hmm. but because there's that reward loop that you're constantly adding Bitcoin and increasing the ledger integrity, when we stop that increase and kind of stop maintaining a future looking ledger, does Bitcoin then lose that value because it's no longer growth and there's no longer interest in continuing that ledger? Possibly. It's, uh, what is it? Theoretically what's meant to happen is that the transaction fees are meant to increase to a sufficient point of which it will incentivize people take part in the continuing consensus process. We do see the transaction fees increasing over time on average. So it seems to be at least a very early stage working. Whether it will be a sufficient amount to, to ensure the, the smooth running of the system at that point, I'm not sure. That remains to be seen. Um, it's a lot of theoretical stuff here that sounds great in theory, but practice is, uh, is, is unclear, but it's a, it's a good question. I'm not sure. So, so why 2040? So the, there are a certain number, remember I said there's a certain number of solutions you can get to these math problems. Mm -hmm. Once they exhaust themselves, and remember also that the difficulty ratchets up, so the transactions will process around every 10 minutes. So at a certain point, it will be just exhausted, and you can kind of plot out mathematically that it will be in 2040 as a result. They kind of ration out the problems over time, uh, and they because the number of Bitcoin that are released decreases geometrically, um, you can just yeah, mathematically work out it's 2040. Which is, I mean, clever again, right? That you could, uh, that they thought ahead, whoever did it thought ahead to, uh, to, to set that up. I, I think it's quite nice. Great. We're feeling good? So. Uh, who gets the transaction fee? The person that finds the solution to the math problem. So the miner that finds the solution gets the transaction fee. So you don't need a transaction fee if I transfer Bitcoin to him. That's, there's no transaction fee for that. No, you're paying the, the miners. Okay. Yes. You're paying the miners. All right, if we're okay, and we're up to speed, um, this is all very technical. And it's, uh, it's interesting, it's elaborate. Um, I think it's interesting, but something that's even more interesting, kind of the reason that I kind of stumbled into this space is because, um, as I'm sure there's plenty of tech policy people here, people design technologies and then release them into the wild. And uh, all these people go out and start using the technologies in ways in which the original designers did not intend. Um, and particularly when networks are involved, you end up with these emergent behaviors that can be difficult to predict. Um, and 
end up being these fascinating manifestations in the way in which the complex world uh, behaves. That's what the second part of the discussion is going to be about. Um, I'm sure you've noticed, uh, particularly in the last 18 to 24 months, something's happened. Uh, Bitcoin price has just gone skyrocketing. Um, from, uh, and it's had some hiccups along the way, but it just keeps going. It was up near 6,000 bucks this week, uh, at least in US dollars. And uh, one of the questions that I ask myself a lot, uh, and some, when I've done this talk in the past, people have asked me, they ask, so wh what is it worth? You know, so what if you're doing this mining process and the math problems are difficult? Uh, what, do you, what do you mean these ledger dollars, you know, that you can't even hold them, they don't mean anything? It's all too abstract. And so something that I spend a lot of my time thinking about is, well, what drives uh, people's perceived value of the Bitcoins, or crypto ledgers, currencies uh, in general? I hear some people say that it's the cost. So remember, when you're trying to solve these difficult math problems, you're using computers. Computers require power, and power costs money. And so I see sometimes people saying, well, uh, the value is some function of the, the energy input. Um, I didn't mention this before, but if you go to China, uh, you find these things. Uh, people have gone and set up entire warehouses full of computers solving these math problems at a scale that would just blow your mind. Uh, why are they doing it there in China in these specific places? Often they're doing it because A, they can get the C GPUs, CPUs, they can get the graphics cards at the lowest cost, right? You just take it out of one factory, put it into the other, instead of shipping it across the uh, Pacific uh, to the United States. Second reason they'll do it is, uh, China has, has and often has a lot of problems around oversupply. Energy is one of them. So they'll set up these big dams generating a whole lot of power that nobody wants. So you'll turn up and you'll knock on the door of your local official and say, hey, you've got a whole lot of power. Uh, would you like some money for it? Because no one else wants it and then use this input for Bitcoin mining. Uh, it's really quite impressive. Uh, this is an emergent phenomenon. People setting up giant centers to solve math problems to get Bitcoins. It's a little bit like if you've ever been to an offshore tax haven or if you've been to Delaware. Uh, <laughs> you'll find that there are these big buildings with thousands of companies supposedly inside of them. Uh, why are people doing that? Because they've set up the laws in a way in which uh, it makes it advantageous to base yourself, your, your company, uh, out of one building and thousands of people do it. This is a similar thing. We've created a really weird incentive structure that uh, provides reasons, financial reasons for people to do this. But the reason I point that out to you, except, except from the fact that it's fascinating, is that I don't think it could, be cost, it could possibly be cost, or it couldn't be a large determinant. Uh, because so many people are doing it at such low cost, that, uh, and we see such a fluctuation, an increase in the price. I don't think it could be that. Uh, the other part of it could be the supply. And this is why this idea that they'll run out of Bitcoins at a certain point, because the supply is capped, is interesting. Um, I'm from Sydney, Australia. It's on the, it's on the uh, harbour, a uh, beautiful harbour. And the houses on the harbour go for a crazy amount of money. They're very expensive. One of the reasons for that is that there's a, just a restricted supply. Not everyone can live there. Uh, and as a result, when you've got relatively restricted supply and increasing demand, it drives the, the, the price up. This could be part of what's going on, although I'm, I'm increasingly thinking it's not even that. I think it has more to do with demand, or perceived value, uh, than anything. Usually for something that's a, a money or a currency, it's, it's a, a means of exchange uh, that we can use in commercial transactions. It's a store of value, that is, it, it holds value and retains it over time. And it's a unit of account. Now, Bitcoin doesn't do all of these things terribly well. This is why, remember the original uh, history of money, uh, we've got a whole lot of different ways in which we uh, do transactions. Uh, we've got a whole lot of different currencies and so on and so forth because they've each got certain strengths and weaknesses in these three areas. Um, this is where things start to get a bit unhinged. There's demand for the Bitcoins, but then there's a perceived uh, 
price or value in, in the future, a, specul a speculative bet in essence. So I have trouble differentiating between one of two things. Either the demand is being driven uh, from people trying to evade capital controls. Uh, we often see when the Chinese government says we're going to cl clamp down on Bitcoin, the price dips uh, and then it recovers. So you know, clever people find ways around the new rules. I have the feeling a lot of people have been trying to get money out of China for the last two years, and that's driven a lot of the increase in demand, the restricted supply. I also have the feeling there's just a lot of speculation going on. Uh, this is the, the hallmark of a bubble. Uh, people buy things not because it's got value, but because they think that it's going to have more value tomorrow. And as more people pile in, it creates this feedback loop that drives the price up until everyone realizes that they've you know, lost the plot and it all comes crashing down. Um, that's what I think is going on with the value, uh, my opinion. But it's, uh, there are no clear answers here, and they change over time as these dynamics change. So keep that in mind as you watch this and other uh, crypto ledger projects, um, that all is not quite what it seems, and what seems to be one way might change today might change tomorrow. So you've got to be quite flexible in your thinking. Um, Keep in mind that Bitcoin is an experiment. It's been going on for about eight years. This whole space is one big experiment, really. The, the hallmark features of Bitcoin were immutability, decentralization, transparency, freedom, and trustlessness. And I say here, you know, what could possibly go wrong with this? Uh, you know, all these well-intentioned uh, elements, uh, when you introduce them to the real world, can go in haywire in all kinds of interesting ways. Remember, I, I showed you the picture of the Chinese Bitcoin farm. Uh, that is an interesting uh, emergent phenomenon. And so your question before about um, mining centralization, this chart here on the right uh, helps us understand a little bit what's going on there. Um, it's supposed to be decentralized. Remember, the internet was supposed to be decentralized, right? Uh, but we know that there are certain elements that are not decentralized and certain elements that have a tendency to centralize over time. Now, the mining process is driven by people who are trying to solve math problems. And what would you want to do? You would want to have as much mining power as you possibly could um, to increase your odds of solving the, the, the problem and, and getting bitcoins in return. So people end up pooling their mining power. And so they increase their probability of a group as a group of solving a problem, and then they divvy up the rewards between them uh, if they do actually successfully find, uh, solve the problem. Well, what happens over time then? The pools start increasing in size. And what you end up with is a few, only a handful of pools that end up making up the majority of the mining power. And this is your question before about 51% uh, 50, 50, attack. Uh, how, what incentive? There's a very strong incentive to game the system, uh, very strong. And this is, this is what's happening. Uh, it's partly people trying to increase the odds of them actually solving the problems. And over time, if someone wanted to put enough money into it, uh, and it would be a lot of money, but not inconceivable, uh, you could amass more than 50%, or you could create a cartel uh, and control over 50%. And this is very interesting uh, because the network protocol has to be updated over time. You might hear occasionally this term of hard fork. To actually do these hard forks, you need to get the majority of miners on board. Uh, and if the majority of miners say no, and they have been, uh, you can have problems running this network at scale over time. Mining concentration, intermediaries. Remember this was meant to remove intermediaries. Well, how do you get your Bitcoins into US dollars? You have to have a, an intermediary. You have to reintroduce intermediaries. And what's tended to happen is people open up a Bitcoin exchange, uh, they'll take in a whole lot of money, and then they'll disappear to Hong Kong. Uh, they'll take all your money, take all your Bitcoins, and you'll be left with nothing. And there's no, really no recourse uh, in, these, in these cases, uh, unless you know, the FBI and starts collaborating with their Chinese friends or Russian friends to drag these people, or they catch them when they go to a tax haven. Um, that has started occurring. Introducing intermediaries uh, introduces new risks into the system. The block size. Remember I said that the blocks are one megabyte each. 
You can only pack so many transactions into a megabyte, and as you increase the number of people who are operating on the network, there needs to be more transactions. So what's ended up happening is a big civil war has broken out uh, between the original people who run the code base and a bunch of people who say, well, we want a bigger block size because we're sick of paying large transaction fees and we want to be able to do more transactions, increase the capacity of the network for sustainability. Well, people who run these pools have said, no, we're not doing that. So what's ended up happening is this big civil war is split off in this hard fork in two different directions. Uh, and this keeps happening throughout all of these projects. Uh, remember, they said that this was going to be decentralized in freedom. And actually, all it does is concentrate a whole lot of power in a few different hands uh, of influential people. And we get back to the politics all over again. It's inescapable. Uh, mention the transaction fees go up over time. And this last one, I like this one. Ransomware, you've probably heard about. It uses Bitcoin for ransoms. Uh, I liked this. Somebody said after an Arpeggio attack, I was watching a Kaspersky thing. Uh, they were getting emails saying, well, can you call up Bitcoin and tell them to give me my Bitcoin back? I didn't get my encryption keys when I paid the ransom for the ransomware attack. And what that shows is, and I think even Jamie Dimon did this the other day. <laughs> People don't realize that it's not like a bank. You just can't go knocking on the door and saying, give me back my Bitcoin. In fact, it was designed to do precisely the opposite. So if anybody has ever made mistakes or had a... Uh, pay for anything online and not receive the goods, you've usually got some means of recourse. With this, you don't. Tough luck. Uh, you've lost your Bitcoins, you've been duped, uh, and that's, that's your bad luck. Uh, that's one of the things that uh, is an interesting phenomenon. Uh, I haven't seen many new projects actually build in some means by which people can get their money back, uh, but I suspect that's where it will go in the future. Beyond Bitcoin. This is where I'm going to give you some pointers and directions you might want to look at, because uh, there's some interesting stuff going on here. Uh, given all the shortcomings I've just told you about Bitcoin, uh, some of which uh, were obvious early on, some of which have become obvious later, a whole lot of people have now started plowing money into new projects, new protocols, new companies, um, to try and remedy some of those problems, and in a way reconfigure this technology to be able to fulfill use cases beyond that which Bitcoin is originally designed for. First one, building bigger blocks. Uh, in most cases now they think through at least some mechanism to increase block size, so you don't end up with one of these civil war-like outcomes. Uh, so they create governance mechanisms. Uh, they'll either build that into the protocol itself or they'll build it in organizationally. Uh, that's this kind of the Bitcoin XT book. Question, how, well, we've gotten rid of the account of the bookkeepers, we've gotten rid of the banks and the payment providers uh, with Bitcoin. What other intermediaries could we get rid of to save money? Uh, this is where Ethereum comes in a little bit. It's not just what Ethereum does, but it is being used to, in essence, they create what they call smart contracts, create decision-making mechanisms where if certain conditions are met, uh, a certain action is taken. Uh, similar to the way in which a commercial contract might work, you write off a series of conditions, someone fulfills the conditions, the contract is completed, you fill, finish up all the terms. It's got a lot of problems, uh, but it is happening and it's worth keeping an eye on. Are you saying they might get rid of lawyers then? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's an interesting question. They're called smart contracts, and you'll see in the next slide, that there's, a, there's a wrinkle to that. Uh, you can't get rid of the lawyers. They can change their jobs, but uh, anonymity instead of pseudonymity. For a very long time, people were running around saying that Bitcoin is anonymous. Bitcoin is anonymous. You don't know. There's a whole lot of people who thought this and now in the slammer because Bitcoin is not anonymous. It tracks every transaction on the network uh, historically. Uh, tremendous transparency. Uh, and those uh, accounts are linked to a unique identifier. Now, that identifier is not linked literally to the person, um, so it's pseudonymous. Uh, but often these people are very silly and they use the same account to do big ransomware attacks and then all you have to do is trace the IP address and go knocking on their door. So uh, this is having woken up to this, we're starting to see certain projects introducing anonymous transactions. Zcash is one of them. Uh, keep them in mind. Consensus, your question about proof of stake versus proof of work. 
Um, proof of work is extremely computationally intensive and expensive. It's a really inefficient way in which to come to agreement uh, between a bunch of people. So certain projects have come up with this idea of proof of stake, where it's the holdings of the cryptocurrency that you've got that gives you a proportional vote in how decisions are made. Um, I, there are a variety of attacks, theoretical attacks, that make this difficult in practice. So I haven't seen any proof of stake actually in the wild yet, but they're working on it. Uh, so that's another modification. And then there's private and permission blockchains. When all the, the blockheads started running around and saying we can use blockchain to solve everything, what a lot of them didn't realize was that it's all public. It's a public ledger that's shared and everyone can write to, which is horrible if you're trying to run a bank uh, and you're trying to work with only a few uh, limited clients. That is, you only want certain people seeing what's going on. You only want certain people being able to write to the blockchain shared ledger. So we're now seeing a lot of interesting stuff out of IBM, for instance, around what they call permissioned or private blockchains, which is where the reading and writing abilities are just toggled uh, to allow only certain people to read, only certain people to write under certain conditions. All right, this is going to round it out. Policy and legal issues. I think the pseudonymous and anonymous transactions one is relatively obvious. The feds got on this very quickly. Uh, they started running around saying it's anonymous transactions were in trouble, and then the tech people reminded them it's not anonymous, and they've made a lot of progress. Of course, the technology will keep moving. Uh, and what we're going to end up having is one day someone's going to wake up and say, oh my god, Zcash or Monero's been used uh, to pay terrorists, and we have to shut it down. And they're going to have a lot of trouble shutting it down, because once these protocols are out there, uh, they're very hard to, you can't, it's hard to put the genie back in the bottle. So uh, thinking through the implications for this on terrorist and anti-money laundering uh, laws and regulations will be important to ensure that they keep up with the technological change. And it's coming. It's, it's not a question of if, it's a question of when in this case. Uh, the ransomware is the other element. Once these anonymous uh, currencies come out and they have relative stability, you'll start seeing them be used in ransomware even more. Uh, ransomware is very clever in a way. Uh, it's not very well coded at the moment, um, but there's going to be a lot of innovation around ransomware. They're going to improve their coding, they're going to improve the rate at which the ransom is set, and they're going to improve the cryptocurrency that they use so that they're able to get it anonymously and withdraw it. Uh, and that's going to be big trouble, big, big trouble. Initial coin offerings. Uh, this is especially in the, uh, the context of Ethereum. Has anyone heard of ICOs, initial coin offerings? Yeah? Everyone's going nuts about them. The idea is that you create your own Bitcoin, in essence. And what you're doing, or you're meant to do, is say, rather than issuing shares in the company, we're going to issue you tokens that you can then redeem in the future, either for whatever product or service we're going to provide, um, or you'll be able to sell the tokens, because whatever we're going to provide will provide so much value that your tokens will be worth something, and you can sell them and then cash in. Um, it's a really good idea in some ways, uh, but like all ideas, they have bad sides. Uh, and so there's a tremendous amount of fraud happening. So people you know, are minting new coins every day. The underlying business concept is probably not very rigorous. They just see some cheap money, uh, dupe a bunch of people, uh, leave the, uh, the, the code base to rot and run off with the money. That seems to be happening a lot. And when the SEC, the SEC is watching this a little bit, and when, when it gets to a sufficient level of fraud, uh, they're gonna come down on people like a ton of bricks. So better think that through. Remember I've been saying that I don't like, I'm using crypto ledger now, because uh, it's a ledger that uses crypto, uh, cryptographic techniques. You'll hear currency, security, asset, commodity. And depending on who you speak to in Washington, they'll give you a different answer. Uh, the IRS likes asset. They like assets so they can tax you. Uh, the SEC likes security because that's what they think about. People don't like currency, because currencies have to be state sanctioned. Uh, to a degree, and so they don't like currency, but we do see commodity. The Commodities and Futures Trading uh, Commission came out, I think yesterday, and said we like commodities. So depending on who you ask, these things are, are different, and they'll be taxed differently, and uh, their relative legality will be different. Uh, and there's no answers here yet. Uh, we're in the process of thinking it through. So 
not only do we not have answers now, but as this technology keeps evolving, we need to come up with new answers. Uh, and that will lie in the future. Final one, and this is your point, Joe, uh, Ethereum smart contracts, they're not smart, and they're not contracts. You probably notice with everything that's called a smart something, it does really dumb things. <laughs> and this distributed autonomous organization uh, is an example of that. It was uh, meant to be a, a venture fund that exists on Ethereum. And the idea was that you could buy the tokens with Ether, the native cryptocurrency of uh, Ethereum. And in turn, you could vote on how the money would be distributed to different companies or different projects uh, in a similar way to which venture capitalists you know, decide to invest in certain companies that they think are promising. But the code was not very well written. Someone worked this out, uh, exploited the code, and started siphoning the money out. Uh, not very smart, smart contract, uh, that one. And a lot of people love, well, they, that's a bit too much to go into. The point is that the actual way in which these contracts are coded uh, can be really dumb, and so um, that's one problem. The second problem is that they're not contracts. Uh, they're not legally enforceable contracts. When the, the distributed aut autonomous organization had this incident, they go running around saying, well, we need police, we need people to go and get the bad guys. Uh, sorry, you intentionally said you don't want to be part of the legal system when you started doing this. It's not a legally enforceable contract. And will it re replace lawyers? Probably not, because everyone's going to start disputing what was in the contract, and that's what we have lawyers to begin with anyway. Uh, so the lawyers aren't going anywhere, I'm sorry. Uh, but uh, these, and neither are the Ethereum smart contracts. They're going to be there. Uh, it's going to be very interesting to see it evolve as we make lots of mistakes. Uh, but I see a lot of progress at the moment in that space and all other spaces. Uh, tremendously exciting stuff. We're going to post these slides, as I mentioned. Uh, this is really just an introductory talk. Um, these links are all very good. If you were to spend your time trying, if you were interested in continuing to pursue this stuff, uh, it is a rabbit hole. But at least this will, I hope, help save you a bunch of time in avoiding uh, silly and hype-filled um, stuff that we get in, with new technologies. This is all very good explainers, all very good uh, explanations of where this technology is going, what it's capable of. So I'd encourage you to have a look at that if you're interested. Um, I'm going to stop talking now. We'll open up for more questions. I'll just check how much time we've got. We've got about 10 minutes for questions. Let's give oh, a better, uh, uh, round of applause. Okay. does seem like the regulation of blockchain or crypto ledgers will become inevitable, especially given state licensing schemes. Yeah. Do you have an opinion of the three regulatory bodies that you mentioned at the federal level that would be best equipped to handle any sort of federal regulation? Um, it will depend how they're being used. The SEC, I, I saw the SEC release a paper on the distributed autonomous organization. I read through it and they know what they're talking about. So, and they're going to do it anyway. They've decided this stuff is, I call it the duck test. Looks like a duck, walks like a duck, quacks like a duck. It's a duck. It's the same with securities. Uh, so these things are in the Ethereum are securities. Um, so that's going to happen. The IRS has already said they're going to be part of it. Um, they want to be getting people's capital gains on any uh, holdings that they have. So the IRS is on it. Um, and yeah, the Commodities and Futures Trading Commission, they are also on it. Because some of this stuff can be used for speculative investment. Uh, it can represent futures contracts. Um, so they will want to handle into it. And it seems to be an edge of decisions. I'm going to put you on the spot, but I'm wondering if there's a Coinbase SEC John Doe subpoenaed. I don't know the extent you know the details of that, but do you mind if you do explain it to people who have not said no? Yeah, so Coinbase is one of these intermediaries that allows you to set up an account, buy Bitcoin, Ether, or Litecoin with US dollars, um, buy and sell, basically. And the IRS went to them and said, well, we want to know all of the people who've got accounts with you, because we want to make sure they're paying taxes on the cryptocurrency holdings that they've got. 
And the IRS went and said, give us all you've got. Uh, and if you've ever, you know anything about networks, you know that usually it follows the Pareto law, that 80% of the people are doing 20% of the transactions. So it's not really very helpful to capture all of them. And instead they've decided they want to get everybody who's got holdings above 10,000 bucks. And so in that way you're capturing that 20% that does 80% of the activity, and probably the people who, who you would get most tax dollars out of. So it's, it's a John Doe subpoena with an unknown number of... They've adjusted it <laughs> okay. since. They've ratcheted, they've ratcheted yeah, to 10,000 and above. Okay. Um, I think they also just want to see what people are doing. They want to find people who are evading uh, tax evasion. That's what they're looking for. Huge cryptocurrency holdings that they're funneling offshore using Coinbase. So, yeah, that's what's going on there. So, so uh, when a Bitcoin is mined, do you, do you get a boss chain with that? And then if it's transferred around, the chain gets longer, showing all the transactions? Yeah, so as the transactions occur exactly, they'll be appended to the blockchain. So what happens in 100 years when the chain of one Bitcoin's transaction is you know, bigger than all the storage spaces? That's one of the, the issues. You know, Remember they say that anybody can join, everyone can be a part. Well, you've got to have a computer that has about 50 gigabytes of storage today. Uh, and in, unless they can find some way to compress it, uh, I've seen some ways in which people just use the headers. Uh, to compress the amount of uh, space that's needed. But yeah, at a certain point, well, I guess they're hoping that Moore's law is gonna mean that you know the cost of storage, the cost of computing power is all gonna keep falling, sufficient to allow people to, to keep uh, storing this blockchain and to keep appending to it and keep mining it. Uh, remains to be seen, huh? What's actually gonna happen? But that is, a, again, a, a, an emergent phenomenon to keep where do you see this technology being potentially applicable outside of the financial sector? So I try and differentiate between anything that involves a digital, you know, we, we say that everything's going digital now and data is your most valuable commodity. It's the new oil and all kinds of things like that. Anytime that something is purely digital, uh, this setup can work quite well. I've seen it with things like cloud storage, file coin, because uh, what you're doing is transmitting digital information around, right? Data. Where it doesn't work well is when you've got to inter introduce more intermediaries. So remember this works very well because it eliminates all of the intermediaries. And when we add people like um, exchanges, uh, all of those old problems of having gatekeepers come back. Um, this is why things like we're going to put land titles on a blockchain in Guatemala and everyone will be happy. It's just a pipe dream. Not only is that not the reason that there are problems in Guatemala, um, but this doesn't this technology doesn't even solve the problem you think it does, or those people thought it did. So that's the other test I would run. It doesn't involve some physical embodiment of addition of addition of more gatekeepers. That'll help you. It's a litmus test in a way. Thank you. Hi, thanks. Um, I'm curious to hear what you're following in terms of novel applications of blockchain for civic purposes. I've heard some people float the notion that blockchain could actually be used to do direct democracy and voting at scale. Um, certainly election fraud uh, has been a, an issue of much discussion over the past year. I'm curious if you have thoughts about that or any other um, novel applications. Well, again, we got to say, what's the problem we're trying to solve here? Part of the problem, and Joe, you, Joe is the expert on election stuff, so you can jump in if, uh, if I say anything incorrect. Um, what's the problem with elections and voting? A small part of it is that you want to have some record of the vote, right, that's immutable. So you know every, everyone was voted for everything, you can go back and audit it. That's one small part of like a whole ecosystem of problems. I suspect what happens is when you introduce the, the, the elaborate technology solution, uh, you start finding that actually the problem lies elsewhere, like what are people voting? What are the options available to people, available to people who are voting? Who gets to do the auditing? What information is stored on there immutably? Is that really information you'd want stored forever? 
I know from spending time in Venezuela that, uh, just quickly, uh, about, well, it was over a decade ago, there was a referendum. Do you want Hugo Chavez to be president? It was after the US had sponsored that coup. And people went out and voted. And they, had, they do electronic voting in, in Venezuela. And so what happened? Uh, they took the results, uh, people's names, addresses, who they voted for. Uh, they burnt them onto CDs and sold them on the street. Uh, so anybody who had voted against Chavez was blacklisted from government departments and from companies that were in support of Chavez and his, his socialist government. Do you really want to have big, immutable ledgers of information that everyone can access? Uh, probably not. But could you configure this in a way that might solve some of the problems? Maybe. You're likely, perhaps you're not solving the really deep problems that fail the democracies. Um, you might be missing here. The, the bigger picture is, is my feeling. Um, maybe one more? We have exhausted your ability. <laughs> <laughs> this is good. Well, thank you once again, Ben. Thank you, awesome. everyone.